So our first question to um, Um Jamaluddin. What is the Quran and why does it matter generally? Why is there so much emphasis on the Quran in our religion and why is it so important in our daily lives? In Alhamdulillah, Nahmadu, who was Taino, who was Taufiro, no to Wulay, who was Soli, who was Selim, Anna Nabiya, and Mohammed, while Ali, he was Sophie, he Ejmain. Allah Malimna, May and Fauna, when Fana Bima, Alamtana was in Naina, in the Kanta Samin Koridum Mujib. First of all, um, Salam Alaikum, or Rahmatullah Rakatu. So you're asking the question, um, what is the Quran and why does it matter generally? Um, look, one of the things we find, one of the common problems we, we, we see um, that a lot of people face once the vibe of, vibe of Ramadan is over is how to stay consistent with the Quran. Um, and that's why you'll find even a lot of people, they'll ha hardly even open the Quran the rest of the year. And um, the common reason they'll tell you for that is because they tell you that, you know, they're too busy and they don't have time to read. So this is... Um, you know, what this shows you is that, in fact, it shows that, you know, a lot of people, they still haven't properly understood, you know, what the Quran is. Um, and they haven't realized how much they're in actually in need for the Quran, not just, not just in Ramadan, but in every day of their life, right? Um, because if a person truly knows what the Quran is and how much benefit it brings to your life, um, you would never be able to leave it. So we need to realize that, you know, we cannot expect to feel close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or to maintain our level of iman after Ramadan if we are not making the Quran a priority in our daily and weekly schedule. Um, you know, we say we want to feel close to Allah, but yet we are literally shutting out one of the most important connections Allah ta'ala has given us in this world to feel close to him. So we need to keep reminding ourselves that, you know, these are not just any words that we are reading. You know, these are literally the words of Allah Azza wa that, you know, Allah Ta'ala has sent down these words to us, you know, which are a living and eternal miracle for us to seek nearness to him, you know, through these words. And, you know, they are an actual act of ibadah for us when we recite them. And one of the greatest acts of worship, actually, that a person can seek nearness to Allah, you know, through these words, right? Um, and this is why Allah Ta'ala even named you know, his book, the Quran, you know, which is derived from Qara'a, meaning that which is recited. So that's why even if you don't understand a word that you're reading, you need to realize that, you know, every ayah you recite is, you know, purifying you and raising your level with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Um, the other thing we need to remind ourselves is that, you know, the Quran is not like reading any other book. You know, no matter how much you read it, you always, you know, benefit from it in so many countless ways. Um, and this is why you need to keep, you know, um, you know, making yourself realize your need for the Quran, right? And I just want to quickly mention as well, a couple of the benefits that the Quran brings to your life, because a lot of people just don't even reflect on this, you know? So the, the first, you know, the first way that the Quran benefits your life, right? Allah Ta'ala in the Quran, he describes the Quran as Habdullah. So he described it as the rope of Allah So you've got to understand that this Quran is literally your lifeline to Allah. And a lot of, you know, we find that, you know, many people this time, what do they complain about? They complain about, you know, feeling spiritually empty or not connected, you know, or that they're struggling just to stay afloat in this life. They complain of, complain of you know, spiritual unrest. So we need to realize that, you know, the Quran was sent by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to us to comfort our hearts, you know, to strengthen us and, and, you know, help us get through the trials of this life. And we all know the huge amount of trials that the Prophet sallam, went through in his life. Um, and so one of the, the most major sources that, you know, enabled him to face all of those trials was the sending down of the words of Allah ta'ala to him, which was, you know, which were constantly strengthening him and, you know, spiritually nourishing him. And so we need to realize that just as the messenger of Allah وسلم, would, would, you know, find solace and strength in reciting, for example, the ayat about the trials that Musa was going through or, you know, the trials that Yusuf or Ibrahim went through, right? We need to realize that, you know, 
um, the shifa or the you know the healing for our hearts is in doing the same thing. Allah Ta'ala Quran says, Kadalika linuthad bita bihi fu adak. You know, this is how we have strengthened your heart, right? So recite it, recite the Quran with tartil, right? So if this is what the Quran was doing for our beloved messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who is at the peak of his, you know, the peak level of Iman, right? Then how much more are we in need for it? Um, another, okay, that's the first main benefit, one of the main benefits, right? Um, and then another of the main benefits, the way that, you know, the, the, the Quran can impact your life is that, you know, the, the Quran is in fact, you know, the, one of your greatest motivators to want to, to want you, you know, greatest motivator to, you know, want, make you want to strive and to keep you focused on your purpose in this life. If you look at this life, you know, so many things are trying, are pulling you back and making you forget about Allah and forget about the Akhirah, right? But what spending time with the Quran does is it gives you time out from your problems and from the noise of this dunya and it basically awakens your soul, right? And puts you in a state of awareness of the akhirah and the reality of this world. So that's why, you know, when you recite the Quran, you feel it constantly recharging your iman and, you know, and strengthening you. Even you don't realize how much the Quran, when you recite it, is reaffirming your aqidah. It's realigning your mindset as a Muslim even, right? So that's why you find that the, the closer a person is sincerely to the Quran, right? The more stable you'll find them in their iman, inshallah, because they're constantly plugging their heart into that vital source. Just like, you know, your phone, you have to keep plugging it in to recharge it. Your heart also needs that constant recharging. But the, the effect that the Quran has on our hearts is far greater than, you know, it's far greater it's far greater and, and our hearts are in far more need for the quran than than even our phone is for you know recharging right and this is why when you look at the ulama of the ummah you look at the ulama of the ummah you see how much they achieved in their lives what is the main reason what is the main reason that they had you know were able to achieve why were they so motivated what made them most so motivated right one of the main reasons was maintaining that strong connection to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the quran um, you look at what Shaykh al-Islam Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah achieved, right? For example, any of any of the great imams. Um, and when, you know, you know, they used to see, you know, Shaykh um, Ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah, they, his students would see him um, sitting after Fajr and, and doing a lot of remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, whether reciting the Quran or doing dhikr of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And when he was asked about, you know, what, what was, you know, um, why did he spend so much time, you know, sitting there remembering Allah? He said that, you know, this is my nourishment. And um, if I wasn't to nourish myself in this way, that, you know, that my, my, my um, strength would go away from me. So you need to realize that Allah Ta'ala did not send the Quran for us for the purpose of, you know, reciting it and memorizing it only, right? But rather he sent it as a means to, to, to help us to constantly motivate ourselves and to want to strive you know, and to make tazkiyah of ourselves um, and to, you know, to keep ourselves focused and, and helping us to not lose sight of our main purpose in striving for akhirah. And the last main benefit I'm going to mention just quickly now is how the Quran puts barakah in your life. Like we have to realize that the words of Allah Ta'ala are the most blessed. And, that, and therefore, whoever, you know, recites them and, and memorizes them and, and implements them, they'll find barakah in their life. So subhanAllah, you'll see the barakah that Allah will put, will put in your home, the barakah he'll put in your family, the barakah he'll put, you know, in your rizq and in all of your affair, in affairs, inshallah. Um, and, and like one of the things we mentioned at the beginning, you know, like a lot of people are saying that, you know, I'm so busy, I don't have time for the Quran, but they don't realize that the Quran actually gives you barakah in your time and it gives you barakah in your life. So you need to realize that, you know, basically without the Quran in your life, you won't trace taste the true taste of this life because you've turned away from that connection that you need to have with Allah Azawajal. and this is why the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us about that person with no Quran they're basically like a destroyed ruined house that the one who doesn't have Quran in them is like the destroyed house or the ruined house so this is like the person without the Quran in their life they'll be like spiritually devoid SubhanAllah. So this is just
just a brief introduction into, you know, what is the Quran and what is the significance of the Quran and the benefits we get out of the Quran, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khairan, Um Jamal. And uh, I believe those are very important points that was raised. Um, you know, finding the Quran as a source of motivation. And this is very, this is so important because the Quran is part of our daily lives and our weekly lives. So, and um, also the um, the fact that it grants barakah in our lives when we complain that we're so busy and yet the Quran helps us uh, through lives and through our daily business. Um, our next question we have um, it, um, for Sheikh Jamaluddin. So this is directed to our audience. So university students in Australia. Um, so why is it important um, to focus on the relationship between you as a university student uh, and the Quran? So or why um, why is it important that we have to maintain the relationship between the Quran and never let it go um, for university students? Bismillah. <clears throat> Alhamdulillah. Uh, I'd like to start by uh, reminding the audience uh, of the verse of Allah where he says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Ya ayyuha al-ladhina amanu istajibu lillahi wa lil-rasooli idha da'akum lima yuhyikum. O you who believe, respond to the istajibu lillahi wa lil-rasool, respond to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his messenger when he calls you to that which brings you life, to that which awakens you. And we're talking here about the spiritual life and so this is uh, where we are coming from when we're talking about connecting with the quran and our relationship with the quran we need to be mindful of the fact that this is allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's revelation to mankind until the end of times so when we've established for ourselves that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala exists that he is uh, the controller of this universe the creator the sustainer uh, and we've also established that uh, he is the only one that is worthy of worship. Uh, the, the, the following, um, I guess, tenet or, or belief is that he must announce uh, and proclaim his commandments to his creation. And this is done through revelation, and it has been done uh, through previous revelations. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has sent down this Quran. Uh, it confirms and reaffirms the message or the, the uh, primary message of the previous scriptures, but also it also supersedes those scriptures and uh, is basically, it overrides the specifics of the, uh, of, of the legislation that was sent down previously. And so that's the significance of this Quran. It's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's final revelation to us. Um, and it's in that respect, uh, it is, you know, you know, he doesn't speak to us directly. We don't hear him. But the, but ultimately, uh, when we are looking for answers to our various uh, confusions in our lives, you know, it's, it's somewhere in the Quran, basically. The Quran does have the answers to those existential questions that we may have. Um, and... You know, th this is because uh, the wisdoms and the principles of the Quran are, are timeless. Allah subhanahu wa says, Kitabun uhkimat ayatuhu thumma fussilat min ladun hakim in khabir. That this is a book whose verses have been perfected and then detailed from one who is all wise and all acquainted. And uh, this guidance that we're talking about that comes through the Quran, it basically... Um, it appeals to us both intellectually and spiritually. Of course, you know, uh, in this life, and especially when it comes to university students who are exposed to all sorts of ideas and ideologies, uh, the Quran serves as a compass. Yes, uh, the human mind uh, is, is quite magnificent in terms of what it can achieve. Uh, intellect is, is a very great blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it needs to be guided. Otherwise, it will fall astray. And so, uh, and, and this is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the Qur'an as a furqan, as a criterion. He says, Praise be to the one who uh, sent down the furqan, the criterion, upon his slave, meaning the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 
in order that he may be a warner to all people through this Quran, basically. And, uh, and even when the Prophet وسلم, even though the Prophet وسلم, had a very supreme uh, level of intellect, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala points out that uh, he could never have attained guidance with his intellect alone. And that's why he tells us, or he, he uh, informs his Prophet وسلم, uh, in Surah Ash-Shura, he says, وَكَذَلِكَ أَوْحَيْنَا إِلَيْكَ رُوحًا مِّنْ أَمْرِنَا مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِهِ مَنْ نَشَاءُ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا He says, uh, we have basically uh, sent down to you an inspiration uh, from our command. مَا كُنْتَ تَدْرِي مَا الْكِتَابُ وَلَا الْإِيمَانِ you, you would not have known what is Al-Kitab, what is uh, the book, nor what Al-Iman is. Like you would never have known Iman through your own means. وَلَكِنْ جَعَلْنَاهُ نُورًا نَهْدِي بِي مَنْ نَشَّوْ مِنْ عِبَادِنَا But we have made this Qur'an a light through which we guide whomsoever we wish from our slaves. And so we see the our, our need for that guidance. It's not, it's not something we can achieve through our own faculties alone. And uh, we see this theme expressed uh, in various terms uh, throughout the Qur'an. Uh, so, so Allah, we, we, you know, in the previous verses, Allah Subhanahu wa Taala has described the Quran as a ruh min amrina, and also as a light. Qad jaa'ku min Allahi nuru wa kitabu mubin, and you know, uh, it's obviously a figurative light. It's a light that provides clarity, it provides perspective, and a sense of emotional security, and that takes a person out of al-wulumat, out of the darknesses or the, the multiple. Sources of darkness, ilan nur. When it comes to darkness, there is, uh, when a person finds themselves in darkness, they feel confused, they feel doubtful, they feel anxious and fearful. But then uh, when they have that source of light, they're able to find that clarity and perspective and direction in their lives. Uh, but then is this something that everyone can achieve through the Quran? Does, does someone achieve these outcomes by simply opening up a mushaf and reciting the letters that occur on those pages? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does mention that it's not exactly for everyone. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Huda lil muttaqeen. It is guidance to al muttaqeen, those who uh, are God conscious and are also uh, pious and mindful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And elsewhere he says, Those who sought guidance, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, has guided. And so there has to be an initiative. There has to be uh, that drive and that sincerity to, to seek guidance from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's not for, every, for everyone. Um, and that's why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has said that it's, uh, it causes misguidance. But when it comes to the disbelievers, it causes the, the uh, those who have disease in their hearts, meaning uh, the munafiqeen, it causes them to uh, basically fall into greater misguidance, guidance, uh, misguidance upon misguidance, in fact. So it's, it's compounded misguidance. Um, and so this is the perspective we need to have uh, with regards to the Quran. It's, it's something about, or it, it's, it's meant to revive us and awaken us spiritually and intellectually and uh, be a source of uh, emotional support, especially like, and, and I didn't really touch on the emotional aspect. When it comes to the emotional aspect, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It's uh, a, a form of treatment and a source of mercy from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's sort of that, that final part of that verse. Uh, illustrates what I was mentioning earlier about it being a source of ruin and destruction to uh, the misguided or to, to the disbelievers. It says at the end of that verse, illa It only increases the oppressors uh, in ruin and in loss. And so the sincerity is required. If you have that sincerity, if you have 
the, the earnestness in seeking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's uh, guidance, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will inshallah guide you through this Quran and you'll reap that those benefits bi'idhnihi ta'ala. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله العظيم لي ولكم فاستغفروه إنه الغفور الرحيم جزاكم الله خيرا شيخ جمال والدين for the beautiful um, um, uh, for the beautiful uh, introduction and how we can use the Quran as a compass to nav navigate us um, through our lives um, so as Muslim youth um, they face many challenges and uh, obstacles. So they, they, mainly, they face many obstacles in building and developing the relationship with the Qur'an. Um, so we have our next question for Sheikh Jamaluddin uh, once again. So we have often young people who um, they try to invest extra time and energy during Ramadan to strengthen the relationship with the Qur'an. Uh, but once Ramadan is over, um, life can easily get in the way and the Iman boost that comes with Ramadan is often diminished. Um, so do you have any advice for university students to help navigate um, their busy lifestyle? So there's often that time where um, during Ramadan, it's like they have this um, boost and then towards the end, uh, when, once Ramadan finishes, it just goes downhill. So uh, what are some ways that we can pick it up again, um, just so that we don't lose that connection with the Qur'an? Yeah, well, firstly, I mean, Ramadan is supposed to be a time when we increase our, our ibadah overall, uh, you know, and, and the Prophet Sallallahu would increase his worship in Ramadan. So that, that uh, in and of itself isn't an issue. The issue is... Uh, having some sort of consistency after Ramadan, you know, so it doesn't have to be at the same intensity, at the same uh, level of momentum as during Ramadan, but the main thing is to have something in place. Uh, and that can be achieved by just having a manageable daily schedule or, or having a, a daily routine when it comes to the Quran. Uh, it doesn't have to be several hours. It doesn't have to be even a whole hour. It could be just something that... Um, you know, one tries to fit into their schedule. In fact, when I was in university, uh, one thing I would do is uh, try to revise my Quran on the train to university, to university, you know, so you can, you know, you can sort of fit it and, and work around um, your schedule in that manner. You know, you don't necessarily have to be uh, dedicating um, exclusive time to the Quran. You know, it could be while you're doing something else, if, you know, if it's something like travel, for example. So, um, yeah, you, you try to find that time and you try to keep that as consistent as possible. Uh, the main thing is consistency. It's not so much about quantity, uh, especially if that quantity is, is something that you can't keep up uh, for more than a few days. Uh, if you have that sudden burst of, uh, of motivation and, uh, and inspiration, I guess. Uh, the main thing is in, in two months time, in, uh, in three months time and so forth, are you keeping up a consistent routine when it comes to the Quran? So uh, yeah, having a daily weird, that's, that's absolutely important and sticking to that weird, finding that, that uh, balance. And I think uh, one thing I'd like to um, uh, highlight is the importance of uh, not only revising. So, so if you've memorized uh, several edges that in particular, it's really important that you find, you know, that delicate balance between revising and retaining whatever you've memorized previously and also moving forward and also covering new uh, surahs and ajazat uh, and, and not remaining or not, not uh, I guess, limiting yourself to simply maintaining what's already memorized. So, you know, I, I guess one thing I would recommend is perhaps, you know, aiming for a 50-50 balance, you know, trying to revise uh, half the time that you can dedicate to Quran and also uh, dedicating the remaining half to, uh, to memorizing new surahs and, and new uh, verses of the Qur'an. Uh, and, and that's irrespective of how much you, you can achieve within that time frame. The main thing is that the time frame is specific and uh, it's not something you um, are, are pushing off. Or uh, it, it, look, look, The main thing is, is that it's prioritized in your daily schedule. We're talking about, I mean, we often talk about, you know, the Qur'an being neglected after, after Ramadan. It's because we are putting other things ahead of the Qur'an. We, we, are, we, we think it's, this can wait, but other things can't wait. But we need to uh, realize, we need to lock the Qur'an into our schedules. If it's not locked in, if it's not made a priority, then naturally we'll find something else to prioritize and the Qur'an will get pushed down and 
won't be revisited until the following Ramadan, uh, and this cycle may well, well, you know, continue um, indefinitely. Uh, so yeah, make the Quran a priority in your daily schedule. Give it that time, lock it in, um, and I think that's that's perhaps you know the most important thing. Uh, but whether it's for university students or people who are working, even if you're working full time, I think you know you can perfectly. Uh, it's it's perfectly possible to fit the Quran in, uh, you know, doing like an hour of Quran, for example, after Fajr. If you can dedicate that, you know, that, that will be uh, very amazing. If you can keep that up consistently. Wallahu alam. Yep, Jazakallah khairan, um, Sheikh Jamal, for the advice. And um, yeah, I think it's really important that um, after Ramadan finishes, um, we should always maintain the consistency um, regardless of the amount. So as long as it's consistent and it's done on a daily basis, um, keeping that uh, consistency is, is important. And uh, it, re really, it really reminds me of the hadith that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam has uh, mentioned that um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves those um, actions that are small but consistent. And uh, I think that's really important, especially when it comes to implementing um, the recitation of the Qur'an um, during Ramadan and also outside of Ramadan. Um, so that consistency is key, um, in, inshallah, and that helps us keep that connection um, outside of Ramadan, uh, with the Qur'an outside of Ramadan. Um, our next question we have um, for Shaykha Um Jamaluddin. Um, so all of us experience... Um, Iman highs and lows. So, do you have any recommendations um, for navigating these natural uh, Iman fluctuations in the hopes of staying motivated and connected to the um, Quran beyond Ramadan? Yes, yeah, sure, inshallah. So, look, um, we first of all have to realize that, you know, you're not always going to feel motivated, um, you know, to want to recite. Um, but w w when the Quran has become a life habit for you and you've tasted the sweetness you know that you've tasted that sweetness of what it feels like when you recite it especially if you're reciting it from your heart right when you've memorized it okay i'm not saying memorize the whole quran but what, what you've memorized from it you do get a sense of sweetness subhanallah when, when whatever you um have um whenever you recite what you memorized um and you and also when you've experienced what the quran does in your for you in your life right and so you'll know that, you know, by keeping up your routine with the Quran, that's what's actually going to help you maintain your, your iman in the first place, right? But I just wanted to also go back to some, some tips as well of how to stay consistent, you know, after, um, after Ramadan. Um, first of all, like, you know, how to stay consistent, you know, once you, once you have realised your need for Quran, right? So the, the main issue of why people are not able to stay consistent is they really, it shows they really have not realized their need for Quran yet, right? As I was saying before. But once you've realized how much you are in need for the Quran, you will make it a priority. Okay. When someone knows their need for something, they will make her they will make it a priority, right? So, and then you need to consider your day. You know, everybody has to consider their own individual day and work out which 20 minutes or which hour are you going to designate for the Quran. For most people, it's going to most likely be straight after fudge, or it could be, you know first thing in the morning when they wake up like nine o'clock 10 o'clock something like that um or it could be it could be going before going to bed right so you've got to designate a certain time that that's that's your time for quran now you also have to have an alternative time for when you miss that time because things come up in life right so you've got to have an alternative fallback time you use when you you're not able to um make your original time the other thing is to understand that everybody has bad days Right. Everybody has busy periods in life. And sometimes you just don't find you just don't find time. The whole day passes, maybe a couple of days pass because you just chaos is going on in life. Right. But the main thing is that your default, you have a default time, you know, with the Quran. You, you know, you, what I'm trying to say is your, your default time with the Quran should be there for you. You know, what I'm trying to say that once that chaos has passed, you go back to your normal, um, you know, normal uh, sort of routine with the Quran. Okay, you always come back to that. Um, so that's really important. And then the other thing is too that most people are going to need some type of Quran class or program to keep themselves on track. So you have to really take proactive measures to pretty much force yourself to stay on this path. Like maybe in Ramadan you feel more motivated, right? 
and that's natural. However, after Ramadan, what am I going to be doing? How am I going to be proactive in, in helping myself to maintain and keep on that keep on that system with the Quran, right? Um, another thing that really helps people is setting personal goals. If you set personal goals for yourself, you know, you, you, you have certain goals in like wanting to perfect your recitation, for example, or, you know, maybe you're working towards an ijazah in, in, in reciting the Quran or you, you want to memorize a certain portion of the Quran, right? Um, when you're constantly working towards a certain Quran goal, that's what pushes you to keep busy with the Quran because you're working towards those goals. Um, the other thing is everybody should be thinking about, like, think about where were you in your journey? Where, how far have you reached in your journey this Ramadan that just passed? When you're in, when you're in Ramadan that just passed, where, how far have you come in your journey so far? And where do you now need to go? Where do you, where do you need to move to, to to have improved by next year's Ramadan? So this is what you should be also thinking about. And one thing I also advise a lot of my students is that even if you can't make your goal to memorize the whole Quran, then make your goal to at least memorize, for example, Juz Amma, um, Surat Al Mulk, you know, Surat Al Kahf, um, Surat Ali Imran, you know, Surat Al Baqarah. Those main, um, you know, those main um, sections of the Quran that have huge rewards, right? And one more thing I want to mention as well. Something I meant to mention. Um, first of all, for the sisters that you may have heard about the Qariya app that was released in in Ramadan. A lot of sisters have been feeling a renewed connection to the Quran through hearing the voices of other female reciters. And that is very powerful in, for sisters to use in, in helping them to, um, you know, to want to also learn how to recite the Quran as well. So that's another, that's another thing I wanted to, um, you know, mention. So th those, those are a few ways um, of, of how we can keep ourselves on track, inshallah, on track after Ramadan um, with, our, you know, with our Quran journey. And um, um, inshallah, Sheikh Jamal could also maybe explain to you as well um, um, that, you know, alhamdulillah, um, you know, my husband uh, also, you know, actually um, spent about seven years basically designing a whole, um, a whole um, website all geared towards, all geared towards helping people, um, you know, refine, refine their memorization. I'll just put that over. You speak about that, inshallah. Inshallah. Yeah, so just continuing on that topic. Uh, did you want to speak, brother? Yeah, yeah I was just going to yeah, allow you to go ahead. Yeah, because yeah. Yeah, no, I want to, sure. oh, we want to hear about that, inshallah. It's very interesting. Yeah, so um, I think, yeah, as uh, my mum uh, was mentioning, um, the reality is, you know, even though we talk about consistency, uh, the whole process, the, the experience and the lived reality of uh, memorizing and revising Quran is that it's a very painstaking process. Uh, there are going to be setbacks. You are going to memorize a page, then come the following day and, and find that you're just blanking out uh, and finding the page unfamiliar. Um, that tends to happen, you know, and it's quite a common experience. Um, and, and you may be even like an absolute beginner when it comes to the Quran. Um, and regardless of where you are in, uh, in terms of learning the Qur'an, uh, I would like to remind everyone uh, of the hadith that both Imam, and, Imam Bukhari and Muslim uh, report in their Sahihain that the Prophet وسلم, and, and this is reported by Abu Hurairah, oh, uh, sorry, by Aisha عنها, that uh, the Prophet وسلم, said, الَّذِي يَقْرَرُ الْقُرْآنَ وَهُوَ مَاهِرٌ بِهِ مَعَ السَّفَرَةِ الْكِرَامِ الْبَرَرَةِ وَالَّذِي يَقْرَأُ الْقُرْآنَ وَيَتَتَعْتَعُ فِيهِ وَهُوَ عَلَيْهِ شَاقٌ لَهُ أَجْرًا That uh, the one who is proficient in the recitation of the Qur'an will be with the honourable and obedient ones. Um, so that, that's for the one who is proficient. But then, uh, even if you're not proficient, uh, the Prophet ﷺ mentions that there is a reward. So he mentions, he who recites the Qur'an and finds it difficult to recite, uh, doing his best, you know, he's striving and doing his best regardless of the obstacles, uh, then he'll have two rewards. He'll have uh, a reward for the recitation and also a reward for the effort. Um, so don't lose heart, you know, keep it up, inshallah, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will uh, give you um, that support and tawfiq. And um, as my mom was mentioning, you know, uh, alhamdulillah, my father, um, walilah alhamd, has uh, launched a website 
that would assist anyone who is basically trying to memorize and consolidate their memorization of the Quran. Uh, the website is alquranTest.com. So A L Q U R A N test T E S T dot com. Uh, and this uh, website is compatible with uh, desktop computers, laptop uh, computers, and also tablet devices. It's not compatible with mobile devices, um, just given the the particular layout that that it um, and, and the format that it uses. Um, so uh, this website is basically it's comprised of many thousands of uh, both multiple choice questions. Uh, fill in the blanks questions, you know, you know, all sorts of different questions of different, and, and you can also um, choose different difficulty levels. You can choose which ajza you'd like to um, test yourself on. Um, and so this, inshallah, is uh, a very useful tool that you could use to uh, really consolidate your hefl, inshallah. So the idea would be to memorize a particular portion of the Quran. Uh, it could be a surah, it could be a juz. And then once you feel reasonably uh, confident uh, with the, the quality of your memorization, you can put that to the test and take a particular test uh, that is specific to that portion of the Quran and see how you go and, and really um, see and, and identify any, uh, any possible faults that you may not have been aware of uh, in, in your hefl. Uh, and this can, inshallah, um, I guess, fast track uh, your uh, pursuit for proficiency with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. I mean, we jazakumullah khairan to both Shaykh uh, Um Jamal and Sheikh Jamal. And I really, um, on behalf of everyone, I really thank you for sharing this website. And inshallah, we will try to share it um, to as many people as possible so that uh, they can benefit in memorizing the Quran and to consolidate the memorization. Um, and to pick out the mistakes and test themselves. And I really believe this is such an important process, especially when it comes to memorizing, um, especially um, personally for myself as well. Um, test, um, testing your own memorization is very important uh, to make sure that the the, the, uh, the memorization of the Quran um, remains strong and to pick out mistakes. Um, so the next steps that we can take, so we have... Um, our last question for Sheikha Um, Jamal, uh, um Jamaluddin. So after establishing a uh, solid relationship with the Quran, um, so how can we actually embody its teachings and implement it into our lives? So how do we go about the practicality of the Quran? Yeah, sure. Um, look, so first of all, you know, um, we need to be actively reflecting upon the meanings of the ayat when we recite them. If, we, if we're going to be embodying the teachings, then obviously we need to be reflecting actively when we're reciting the Quran or revising the Quran, right? Now, one of the mistakes a lot of people make is they tend to focus only when it comes to, you know, reading the Quran, they tend to just focus with, you know, on the reading with their eyes and like they're paying attention to the letters in the tajweed but they neglect to also read it with what you could say the eyes of their heart, right? So, um, you know, as we're reciting, we need to be asking ourselves all the time, constantly, you know, what is Allah Ta'ala teaching me through this ayah? You know, how can I implement this ayah, in, you know, in my life? Um, and remind yourself that the main objective behind reciting the Quran and memorizing it is actually to act upon it, you know, and implement in our life. And, this is why we see that Aisha radiallahu anha said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, like that his character was the Quran. That's how, you know, that's how much he was implementing the Quran in every aspect, you know, of his, of his being, subhanAllah. Um, and then the second thing too is to remind yourself that Al-Quran hujjatul lak aw alayk, like the Quran would be either a, you know, um, you know, an evidence either for you or against you. So this is something really scary to think about. You know, every ayah you're reciting and reading is going to be either a witness for you or against you on your qiyamah, right? So what's the use of all that Quran if it doesn't go beyond a person's throat? So that if, may I protect us all from that, but, you know, if a person's words and actions are the opposite of what they're reciting of what they've memorized. So that's 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 scary. You know, I'm trying to say to think that that, that, that whatever you've, you know, memorize what you're reciting is actually going to come as a witness against you rather than for you on your qiyamah. And, you know, we see the Sahaba, like, you know, they had the, the greatest fear 
of that, right? And that's why we see that they wouldn't even move to memorizing the next 10 verses until they had ensured that they'd acted on those first 10 verses. That's how, you know, conscientious they were of that, right? And look at Allah Ta'ala in the Quran says, الَّذِينَ إِذَا ذُكِرَ اللَّهُ وَجِلَتْ قُلُوبُهُمْ وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ زَادَتْهُمْ إِيمَانًا وَعَلَى رَبِّهِمْ يَتَوَكَّلُونَ Right? You know, those believers are the ones who when they, you know, when they remember Allah, their hearts become, you know, they tremble. Their hearts, you know, tremble. وَإِذَا تُلِيَتْ عَلَيْهِمْ آيَاتُهُ Like when the ayat of Allah Ta'ala are, you know, recited, um, their iman is increased. So, they, they, you know, the... The Quran should first of all be affecting our hearts when we recite it and, and revise it, and memorize it. And then that effect on our hearts should then turn into action. So it's not enough just to, you know, to get tears from the Quran. You know, there should be actually, you know, an action with the body as well. Not, you know, the, the heart, you know, the, the, the true effect on the heart leads to action of the body. Uh, and if I may perhaps add on to that, um, you know, and this this illustrates, you know, what my mum was mentioning, you know, that really just illustrates uh, that there are multiple duties we have towards the Quran. You know, it's not simply a matter of reading. Uh, it's not a matter of just uh, understanding. Of course, understanding is absolutely essential. I mean, it's it's basically the uh, the prerequisite to implementation and um, application in our daily lives. Uh, and uh, I mean, of course, on the point of understanding, you know, th there comes the issue of, you know, uh, if you're not an Arabic speaker, what do you do then? Um, no doubt, you know, I mean, the very straightforward uh, solution to that would be to consult um, a reliable and and uh, and decent uh, translation of the Quran. Uh, and some of the more recommended ones uh, are there's there's the clear sorry, it's called the clear, the clear Quran by Muhammad Khattab. That's uh, one of the more recommended translations. And there's also Mufti Taqi Uthbani's uh, translation, and that includes uh, some commentary. So those are two, uh, I guess, more highly recommended uh, translations of the Quran that perhaps uh, do better to capture uh, the meanings of the verses in English. Um, and when we're talking about the duties uh, or our duties towards the Quran, there comes the issue of, uh, you know, if you fail to fulfill those duties, then you may be falling into a hajj, forsaking the Qur'an. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in Surah Al-Furqan, وَقَالَ الرَّسُولُ يَا رَبِّ إِنَّ قَوْمِ اتَّخَذُوا هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ مَهْجُورًا And the messenger said, uh, Oh my Lord, my people have taken an, uh, this, this Qur'an as something to be forsaken and abandoned. And uh, I guess elaborating on this, uh, on this verse, um, Ibn Qayyim rahimahullah mentions in his fawaid, that there are multiple types of hujran of of forsaking in the Quran. Uh, some of these include, you know, the, the very straightforward case of forsaking listening to the Quran, uh, and, and and you know actually listening to it, not not simply just hearing it uh, with your ears, but actually uh, trying to comprehend and uh, understanding its meaning. That's of, that's obviously assuming that the person understands Arabic to a, to some reasonable level. Then there is forsaking or abandoning. Uh, applying it, applying what what can be immediately applied uh, uh, in one's daily life, uh, and another form can be contemplation. You know, so above and beyond just understanding the meaning, is contemplation trying to uh, find how the Quran can be made self-relevant to yourself. And of course, we're talking about issues that are, that don't require a faqih and a mujtahid to basically uh, derive rulings on specific issues. Uh, from the Quran, we're talking about, uh, especially when it comes to sp spiritual matters, you know, uh, matters of the heart, uh, matters of uh, iman and nifaq, you know, like, uh, you know, examining one's one's uh, heart and soul for potential, uh, you know, wh whatever diseases there may be in one's heart, you know, those issues of uh, iman and uh, self purification and tazkiyah, you know, those those are things that one can immediately apply when reciting the Quran uh, and and being prompted. And when prompted by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, to do so, wallahu ta'ala alam. Fajizakullah khair, um, Shaykh Um Jamaluddin and Shaykh Jamal. Um, thank you for um, um, telling us and sharing with us um, 
uh, tips and ways as to how we can practice uh, the Quran in our lives and that is uh, very important uh, as we've learned just as important as reading and memorizing the Quran itself how can we implement it in our daily lives so now inshallah we'll be moving on to um, our Q&A session uh, from the comments that we have received first um, so far in Facebook um, so the first question that we have Bismillahirrahmanirrahim what is the best method um, to do tadabbur and or understand what we've memorized? So I believe that's um, something that we've just covered now. Um, but just in summary, just in a few dot points. It could be um, any of you can uh, feel, feel free to answer the question. Okay, so I'll, I'll go ahead, inshallah. Yeah. Um, yeah, tadabur, I mean, when we're talking about tadabur, we're, we're talking, you know, as I mentioned, it's, it's not just understanding the immediate meaning and di direct meaning of verses. It's also uh, trying to, uh, I guess, make it self-relevant to one's, yeah, to make it self-relevant, uh, you know, in some shape or form, you know. So if we're talking about, even if it's, you know, talking about the stories of prophets, you know, if we're talking about the story of uh, of the people of Nuh or the people of Ad, um, you, you know, it, and, and we see like, or we read about, you know, the punishment that their, the people um, experienced as a result of their disbelief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We, we, it's supposed to, even though we are believers and, you know, they were disbelievers, you know, but nonetheless, you know, the, the believer um, tries to, uh, I guess be mindful of the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, um, you know, is all powerful and uh you know he can punish and, and his, his punishment is severe. And if that's his punishment in this life, well, what about his punishment in the hereafter? You know, so so those are some, I guess, reflections you can make on, on those sorts of stories, even though they occurred in the past uh to a disbelieving nation. Uh and we can also talk about, you know, the I mean, even though yes, they, they were uh, disbelievers. They they rejected and uh, sometimes even um, you know uh, evicted the prophets uh, from, and, and messengers from their cities. But uh, let's talk about the diseases of the soul uh, beyond just the shirk aspect. You know, what about the arrogance? What about the uh, the conceit? فَأَمَّا عَادٌ فَاسْتَكْبَرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ بِغَيْرِ الْحَقِّ وَقَالُوا مَنْ أَشَدُّ مِنَّا قُوَّةً As for Ad, you know, Allah mentions about Ad, they uh, were arrogant. And aloof, you know, and, and they 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 saw themselves as so, uh, I guess, uh, powerful and and uh, self sufficient uh, in the land. And they said, "Man minna quwa, and who is more powerful than us? You know, this was their self image. You know, that they had such a uh, a considered image of themselves. And you know, we we sort of can reflect this. Uh, we can sort of re yeah reflect on that by by looking at ourselves. Do we have that? Can see do, do we see ourselves as as being um i don't know like like uh, greater than than the life size or i forgot the, the exact expression for that but we need to we need to really um, put ourselves in perspective and be mindful of uh i guess uh you know examine our hearts for any possible diseases and 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 that sort of thing yes jazakal um sheikh jamal um, so we have just a few minutes left. Um, we've got some very quick questions. So um, about let's try to do a record and see if we can smash out a question in a minute or two. Um, a very quick one. How do we use the website? Do we need to register? So is there any registrations um, with regards to alqurantest.com? Uh, as far as I know, you, you do register, yeah. Okay. Uh, it's inshallah. it's pretty straightforward, inshallah. Yeah. And the next question, so for Sheikh Um Jamaluddin, as a river, was there any relationship between embracing um, Islam and the Quran? Was there any relationship in so I believe what the question is trying to ask is that yeah. um when when embracing Islam, um yeah. was the Quran a factor? Did yeah. it play a role in it? Actually, the Quran was a major factor. Um, I lived in a time that was back in a time where there was no internet, no very hard to find any reliable um, sources for for you know Muslims back then. Very hard to find any practicing Muslims that could actually tell you in you know 
give you an informed um, knowledge about Islam. Um, so subhanAllah, I just happened to be at uh, someone's house who, you know, they weren't practicing Muslims, but the father had brought home a copy of the translation of the Quran. And um, I just asked if I could read it out of my curiosity. And basically um, it was, and I didn't even know you could convert to Islam. I didn't even know that, you know, it's possible to, you know, for an Australian to be a Muslim. Um, never heard of that. We didn't hear, we didn't hear about revert back then. So basically, um, I just started reading the the, the translation and um, subhanAllah, like Allah put it in my heart that that was that was the truth. You know, when I read um, that, you know, um, that Isa was 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 a human and he, you know, he used to eat and he used to, you know, his his mother and him, you know, they both used to eat and they, you know, they had human traits. They weren't, they couldn't have couldn't have been um, God or the son of God or anything like that. And um, and that, you know, Prophet Muhammad was a final messenger. Like that, that just all fell in my heart. And I didn't know what to do with that or where to go with that, but I just knew that that was the truth. So that was my first introduction to Islam. It wasn't actually through Muslims, like I said, it was um, it was exactly through the translation of the Quran, alhamdulillah. And then I just kept on reading until, you know, eventually, alhamdulillah, like I, I was, you know, I, Allah opened it for me to actually finally find some people that knew what they were talking about. And um, yeah, but it, it, took, it took a long time, alhamdulillah. Subhanallah, that's very uh, interesting, um, Um Jamal. It's like how the Quran is a guide and subhanallah, it has guided uh, you towards um, the true religion, Islam, and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has brought you towards the right path. Subhanallah, uh, especially when I hear about these stories, you know, it, it just amazes um, all of us. That's what I was, I was um, just going yeah. to add something, if you don't mind. I just want to say something because I, w I didn't have the privilege of, of, of having Arabic when I was you know, growing up with, with Arabic, it's a huge difference. And this is this this is a message for all my sisters and brothers that don't have Arabic, because I don't really feel that my Arabic speaking sisters and brothers really have an idea of what it's like not to have Arabic. You know what I mean? And and just to say that, you know, the Quran can really affect your heart, even if you don't, even if you don't have, you know, the Arabic, it can still affect your heart. But obviously, obviously, the more you grow in your Arabic, absolutely, absolutely the impact on your heart is far, far greater. Like the way I compare it is if you hear, you know, Allahu Akbar and you hear someone saying Allah is the greatest, it's completely different, the effect it has on you. That's that's how it is when you re recite the Quran in Arabic. So I do really encourage all my sisters and brothers, even if I know it's a struggle, it's going to take years. It's taken me absolutely years. I'm going to be honest with you. It took me 20 years to memorize the Quran. Alhamdulillah. Um, I, you know, the only reason I'm mentioning that is because it's been a real struggle and it's taken me absolute years to also learn Arabic as well. But wallahi, it's worth it. And just remember that what you get as reward, like, subhanAllah, I feel is there's a wisdom behind that. Like, a lot of people, they've been given Arabic from birth and they take it for granted and they don't actually even, you know, strive. Whereas if you don't have it, often those people, you know, they have to strive so much harder. And and that's that's really a gift from Allah because maybe Allah, Allah opened that way for you to get even more hasanat, inshallah. So just, I just want to give that a bit of encouragement to everybody, inshallah. Inshallah. And jazakallah khair for those words, um, um, Shaykh Akhum Jamal. Um, I think that's really important um, for those who don't have an Arabic background, especially um, don't be disheartened. Um, obviously put effort and strive and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala looks at the effort. Um, so Shaykh uh, um, um, uh, um Jamal, um, in the introduction, I forgot to mention, you do have a BA in uh, Fiqh and Usul from Al Madina International Uni, and also that you're in, in your second year of your master's in uh, Usul, and that you're also an official member of um, ANIC, the Australian National Imams Council. So can you um, tell us a bit about, uh, about that and um, how you worked your way towards that? Alhamdulillah, like uh, I'll tell you honestly, it's been a very, very, very long journey. Um, I actually applied at Umu Qura when I was 22. I went to Saudi Arabia and I was I was absolutely passionate about um, getting a degree. Um, but subhanAllah, it was extremely difficult path. Um, I'll be honest, for females, it's a very, very difficult path. But Alhamdulillah, Allah Ta'ala wanted me instead to take the path of Quran, first of all. And I, I always say, subhanAllah, perhaps if I had have just done that Sharia degree to start up with, I mightn't have ever gone down the path of Quran. 
Alhamdulillah, Allah blessed my life by, I was, I, you know, he opened the path for me through studying at Darul Huda in Jidda. So I studied there. Um, I, you know, eventually got my jaza through Sheikh Karima, who's the student of Sheikh Ayman Suwaid. And wallahi, alhamdulillah, that was a huge blessing because that then enabled me to teach my children the Quran and, you know, and keep going with the Quran myself. And, um, and I kept on going in that path and, and learning Arabic. And I started learning after I, I did a degree in Arabic, actually. Uh, I then started studying Mutun from, from the scholars based in Saudi Arabia. Um, until, alhamdulillah, you know, finally, subhanAllah, I never dreamed it could actually happen because I actually got to the point where I thought it's never going to happen. But I heard about this opportunity to study finally um, get a, a Sharia, Sharia degree. Lots of Mashiach here are actually getting their Sharia degree through this university. And this is finally opening up a door for a lot of sisters because for sisters, it's been very difficult to find anywhere to get a, a quali like, you know, an official Sharia degree. Do you know what I'm trying to say? So min ta'ala, um, finally I uh, graduated about, I think it's been two, you know, almost two years now. And um, now I got, because, you know, this door's opened, I, I thought, you know what, I'm, and we had COVID, so I decided, you know, I'm going to keep going and I'm I'm going to, inshallah, do my master's now, especially my kids have, you know, they're pretty much all grown up. So it's a chance for me to, you know, really take the opportunity and, you know, and and continue this, you know, while I can, because this is this has always been my passion and I never gave up. And alhamdulillah, Allah knew my intention and he's now opened the door for me, alhamdulillah. Jazakallah khair, um, Um Jamal, for sharing that, um, for sharing your story. And I hope, uh, bithnillah, that uh, it serves as an encouragement and a source of uh, motivation, especially for sisters, um, to go and pursue um, the path of knowledge and ilm, uh, to study the Quran, to study Sharia. Ah. Um, because regardless uh, of whether a person is a brother or a sister, um, ilm, seeking knowledge is... Um, is compulsory upon each and every single one of us and it's good to hear that there's these opportunities especially for sisters um to go and study um so that they can gain knowledge so that they can re earn rewards and then they can go back and uh, teach that knowledge and spread that knowledge um towards um the community and that's something that's very important and inshallah uh, i hope really hope in the future that um we see both brothers and sisters thrive with knowledge um and spread um the ilm and the deen and uh, and and give dawah to all uh, to people from all walks inshallah so inshallah we'll be ending our panel over here um once again jazakumullah khairan shaykha um jamaluddin and shaykh jamaluddin um for being here tonight to share your wisdom your knowledge uh, and your uh, tips and advice on how to maintain our relationship with the quran um after ramadan after shahrul quran after the month of the quran um tips on how to maintain the consistency and use that as a source of motivation um so once again i thank um the both of you for joining us tonight uh jazakumullah khairan والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. وعليكم السلام ورحمة الله. جزاكم الله خير.